cover, so let's get down to business. My message today is entitled, Glow Worms and Salty Dogs. And I know some of you are thinking, what's he going to do with that? Well, it's not that hard, really, because Jesus told us that we needed to be two things in our world. Number one, we were to be the light of the world. Number two, we were to be the salt of the earth. And so I'm always thinking of, you know, what metaphor could I give people that they would remember that, that it was kind of stick in your brain and you'd never forget it? And then I came up with it. Glowworms and salty dogs. And I don't see me thinking going, I don't know what either of those are. Well, then you'll be glad you came. See, here's what a glowworm is. A glowworm is actually not a worm at all, but that's its name, and it's a flightless beetle. Here's a picture of it. And what it does, like a firefly, but it's not, is it glows in the dark. There's some sort of chemical reaction that happens. And, uh, you know, National Geographic will tell you that the brighter they glow, the more attractive they are. Who would have thought, right? And it makes me think of this story, and this story is about Winston Churchill. And when Winston Churchill was a young man, he went off to the Boer War, fought the Boer War in South Africa. He came back in 1990, or 1899, rather, and there was a, an election on, and he decided, because he came from a sort of a well-known family, that he would run for parliament. So he runs for parliament, and he gets soundly defeated in this election. So now as a young man, he has to decide what to do. So he decides to become a journalist, and specifically a war correspondent, and he goes back to South Africa to cover the war that was continuing. So he goes, he no sooner gets to South Africa, and he gets captured, and he ends up in a concentration camp. Now here's what happened, is that Winston Churchill, a lot of people don't know this, escaped from the concentration camp. And when he returned to England, he's now a hometown hero. And everybody wants a piece of Winston Churchill because he was the guy who escaped from the concentration camp. There's another election held in the year 1900, only a year later. And because of his newfound fame, he figures, I can win this. He goes and he runs and he's elected as member of parliament by a landslide victory. And he couldn't believe his fame. He said everywhere he went, people wanted to listen to him. And he got crowds of thousands of people. And so someone said, why do you think this is? And this was his answer. Are you ready for this? He said, all men are worms, but I do believe I'm a glow worm. And what he meant was that humanity are all just nothing more than worms, but some people shine a little brighter than others. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So that's the first thing about being a glow worm. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is to be a salty dog. How many of you know what a salty dog is? No, it's not some delicious snack. Uh, this is what a salty dog is. A salty dog is a sailor who has spent more time at sea than he has on land. And these, are, these salty dogs, or sometimes they're called old salts, they're people that are revered for their knowledge of the sea. And if they were ever in a vessel, you'd always defer to the salty dog because they know more about sailing than, than anyone else. And when I think of a salty dog, I think of... Captain Highliner, that's who I think. <laughs> how, how many of you remember that ad from the 1980s? Have you ever been to sea, Billy? <laughs> no, Captain Highliner. <laughs> I had someone say that in the first service from the audience. They knew, they knew the rest of it. And uh, you know, here's, here's the thing about you know, Captain Highliner. He has delicious fish sticks, but he's a, he's a salty dog. He's a guy that spent this time at sea, and uh, he is well-versed in, in, in the salt in the sea. And, you know, I was looking at that picture. How many of you noticed that symbol on his hat? And you know what that symbol is, don't you? That's the, that's the ichthus. And it's not only that, that's the highliner symbol. It's on his hat and it's behind him. And here's the ichthus. And uh, here's what's sort of fascinating about this. Ichthus is that fish symbol. Some of you have it on the back of your car. Some of you don't even know what it means. And I'll tell you what it means. It's actually the earliest symbol of Christianity that predates the cross. We always think of the cross as the symbol of Christianity. The original one was the fish. And Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And here's why. Is the, the word fish in the Greek language is the word ichthus. Now, I should actually know something about this. I studied Greek for three years in seminary. And it's actually an acrostic, and I've put it up on the screen for you there. And this is what it is. Jesus Christos Theos Vios Soteria. I know most of you could read that. And uh, translated into English, it means this. Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Savior. And that's what that symbol was. And the early persecuted church, if they wanted to identify themselves as a Christian, they just did the fish like this. And people knew it was ichthus, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And so 
what I'm going to challenge you to do today is to be a glow worm in your life and to be a salty dog. And so if you're going to be a pirate, and I know some of you are thinking, you want me to be a pirate. If you're going to be a pirate, at least be a Christian pirate. That's what I'm telling you. So Captain Highliner is walking along the street one day, and I don't know if you know this, but he's got a, a wooden leg, and he's got a hook, and he's got a patch on his eye. And he comes up to little Billy, and he says, Billy, have you ever been to sea? And he says, Captain Highliner, what happened to your leg? And he says, Arr, I fell into the sea, and a shark bit it clean off. But the doctor gave me a wooden one that's as good as new. He says, Captain Highliner, how about that hook on your hand? He says, Arr, I was in a sword fight with an, another pirate. He cut it clean off. But the doctor gave me a hook, and that's as good as new. And he says, but Captain Highliner, what happened to your eye? He said, Arr, one morning I looked up at the sky, and a seagull, he pooped right in my eye. He says, you lost your eye to seagull poop? He says, Arr, first day with the new hook. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> All right, so here we are. We are in Matthew chapter 5. We're in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous of all Jesus' sermon, and probably the most powerful. And we're starting at verse 13, is what it says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. A couple of things I want to say about this passage. The first one is this. This very first word, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, in the English language, we don't actually have a plural for you. I could say you, and that means you individually, or you, and that means all of you collectively, or plural. Well, of course, they're, unless you live in the inner lake, and then they have a plural, it's you guys, right? So the, or, or in the south, they, you got y'all. Y'all is the plural. Or if you live in the deep south, they got the plural plural, which is all y'all. Why you have to do all y'all, I don't know. But nevertheless, in the English language, we have you, and we have you. But in the Greek language, there's actually two different words here that we could be used. And it might surprise you to know that when he says you are the light of the world, he's actually not saying you individually. He's saying you collectively. And I know we always think that, that we individually are the light of the world, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, that's great. You want to let your little light shine. But guess what? Your little light is part of a bigger collective light where we are all shining together. And we together become the salt of the earth. And that's our mission. So when we look at this little story, I want you to think about one other thing. First of all, we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And he doesn't say you are like the salt or you are like the light. He says, you are the light, and you are the salt. And this is going to be a bit frightening, but I want you to understand the level of responsibility that puts on us. Because the only reflection that people are ever going to see of Jesus in this world is you. You are the light. You are the salt. You see, Jesus is not going to come and sit in their coffee table across from them and, and say, here I am. How do you like me so far? And the only reflection they're really going to have, the only image they're ever going to have of Christ, unfortunately for us, is us. We're it. Boy, that's kind of frightening, isn't it? And I mean, I, I always play this game with people because people are always complaining about Christians. You know that, don't you? Especially you guys. And they complain to me and I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't judge Jesus by what you see people do. Well, what choice do they have? They don't see Jesus, so they have to judge Jesus by what they see you do. I remember I was on this plane one time. I'm sitting beside this guy and his wife. And of course, it always comes out what I do for a living. So I told him what I do for a living. And very, very proudly, he says, oh, I never go to church. And I said, well, why not? He says, the church is full of hypocrites. I said, you know what, sir? There's always room for one more. <laughs> But nevertheless, that's our challenge is, is, that, is that, you know, people see Jesus through what we do. So it's a big responsibility to be the salt and the light. So one of the things he says about the salt, and I'm going to spend most of my time on the salt here today. One of the things he says is if the salt of the earth, you, 
If it loses its flavor, what good is it but to be thrown down and trampled underfoot? I want you to think about those words for a moment. See, they would have known what Jesus was talking about because in Jesus' day, they had an abundance of salt. Who knows where they get the salt from in Israel? I heard it. They get it from the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is a really amazing place. How many of you have been there? Anybody been to the Dead Sea? A few hands in the room. The Dead Sea is an amazing place. It's 1,400 feet below sea level. So any water nearby flows not to the sea, but to the Dead Sea, where it has nowhere to go. And what it does is it, is it crystallizes there, and the water of the Dead Sea is 9.6 times saltier than the ocean. And, you know, I love this picture of this guy reading the newspaper. He's practically out of the water. He's so buoyant in this. And what happens is this salt in the Dead Sea literally just crystallizes on the shore. And they can just go in and they can just harvest this and the, the abundance of salt is immense. So you see it in these huge piles. It's sort of a surreal place, the Dead Sea, honestly. And so they would ship it to, to Jerusalem or to wherever. And so salt was a very common commodity in those days. And what happened was it sometimes would let, be left out in the rain and the saltiness would be leached out of it. And so now it was no good for flavoring. So guess what they did with it? They literally threw it on the roads. And it controlled the weeds, and they would throw it on, on the ground. And don't miss this. And it would be trampled underfoot by men. So Jesus gives them this metaphor. And he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if you lose your flavor, if you lose your saltiness, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be trampled underfoot uh, by men. That's going to happen. And I want you to think about the 21st century in Canada today. How many of you, if you're a bit on the cynical side, which we're going to be for a few moments here, how many of you, when you look at your values, they sometimes feel like they're being trampled underfoot in Canada? How many of you would agree with that? And I, I think that's true. And I'm going to take a few minutes here, and I'm going to really depress you. Can I do that? I said, well, I don't really need any help. Well, let me do it anyway. Let me, let me just take you down this road for a few minutes, because there's some things you need to know. I've been pastoring for 35 years, and in 35 years, I've been, in, in, to some degree, involved with every moral battle in the last 35 years. And let me tell you something, that we have lost every single one of them. There's never been a battle over moral values, biblical moral values, in Canada that we have won. And 30 years ago, almost 30 years to the date, we lost the abortion battle in Canada. And we had Henry Morgenthaler, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, and he was setting up clinics, and this whole thing went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court struck down Canada's abortion law, 30 years ago, and for 30 years in Canada, we have not had an abortion law. Meaning, it is legal to abort a child at any time up to the moment of delivery. So at nine months, you could abort a baby. Now, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often, but the fact that it is that legal in Canada means that we see 100,000 babies aborted every single year in Canada. In the US, it's a million. And I think it's one of the most reprehensible things that we have ever done as a modern nation where we have made it legal to kill, to murder the most defenseless members of our society. And if you are one of those people that thinks that a baby in the womb is nothing more than a blob of tissue, I suggest you ask any mother that's ever carried a child to term, and she will tell you that is not a blob of tissue. That is a human being with a kick and a heartbeat and a life, and, that, and that's what it is. Every mother knows this. And we have deceived ourselves into thinking this is not a human where it so clearly is. And if you're not clear what God thinks about it, I encourage you to go and read Exodus chapter 21, verse 23. Exodus 21, 23, where God specifically says to take the life of an unborn child is murder. So that's what God thinks about it. So we lost that battle 30 years ago. And we warned when we lost that battle. We said, you know, if, if you start to devalue life, then it's just a matter of time before we have doctor-assisted suicide. And now we have doctor-assisted suicide. And then we've warned this way. We said, well, we have voluntary doctor-assisted suicide now. What happens when it becomes involuntary? What happens when our culture decides that uh, our, our aged and our inform or no, infirm rather are of no longer value to our society? And they uh, project mercy killing. And don't think that this can't happen. It has happened again and again and again through history, including modern history. So this is the journey that we have been on. And then a number of years ago, we had the same-sex marriage debate. 
And, and, and again, you know, that one has played out. You, you know how that's played out. We now have legalized same-sex marriage in Canada. We're, we were the second nation in the whole world to do it. And, and I know there might be someone in here or several people in here, and you might be thinking, I'm not sure I see what the problem with that is. And, and you would have a very, this would be a fair question if you were to say, if two people loved each other, what would be wrong with them marrying each other if they loved each other regardless of their gender? I, I think that's a fair question. And I think I'm going to give you a fair answer on that because not everybody would have the same biblical understanding as I would. And so let me explain it to you. You see, marriage was God's invention. God created it. And if you create something, you actually get the right to define that. And so what happened was God, at the very, very beginning of the book, Genesis, he created man, both male and female, he created them. And then he said to the man, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And God specifically in scripture defines marriage as the union between one man and one woman. There is no other definition of it in Scripture. And there's all kinds of bad examples of stuff that did happen in Scripture, but that doesn't mean that was God's idea. None of it was. And then people today are, are, are telling you, oh, no, there's lots of this that happens in Scripture. Well, it's just not true. If you look in Scripture, you will see from the beginning of the book to the very end of the book, God defines marriage as the union between one man and one woman. There is no other combination. So God has the right to define that however he wants. And so that's what you know, God does, and that's why we would maybe, you know, to some degree, object to it. And that's where we're at on this. And so we see all of these things, these battles, and we just keep going into them and holding up our biblical values, and we lose them again. And, and now, of course, we, we just lost this other one concerning the legalization of marijuana. And I mean, I'm just lifting my hands like this. I don't even get it. We're doing all this to discourage and outlaw smoking, but legalizing marijuana. <laughs> you know, I mean, what's that all about? And then people have a great argument. They say, oh, it's no worse than alcohol. Oh, well, that's a ringing endorsement. How good, because alcohol's never damaged a family or caused a car accident or ruined somebody's career. So that really makes me at peace now to know that another vice will be legalized so the government can have tax money. That's just wonderful. And I know I come across as a real prude. I know people look at me and Mark, they go, Mark, you're a piece of work. I mean, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, you don't even like prescription drugs. Well, you know what? I actually have a good reason for this. When I was 23 years old, I lost one of my best friends in a motorcycle accident on his way home from a party, both high and drunk. And then when I was 29 years old, I lost my cousin to an overdose of drugs. And then I lost my 51-year-old brother-in-law who drank himself to death. At the age of 51, cirrhosis of the liver killed. And I can tell you story after story, I've seen so much personal tragedy in my life that I think, I just don't see any virtue in any of this. And nevertheless, we're merrily going down this path to getting everybody whacked out on dope. Have you seen the new Canadian flag released on, on Canada Day? Oh, you got to see it. you got to love this flag, right? You would laugh, but it's sort of sad, isn't it? So I have one more thing to tell you. I, I know I've depressed you, but I haven't quite got you where I want you and need you yet. I've got one more story to tell you. And this is the most recent one. See, a few years ago, Christian University in British Columbia named Trinity Western University. And it's a private Christian university, and they decided they were going to start a law school. So that seemed good. I mean, they were educating other professions. And then all of a sudden, after that announcement, the Law Society of BC and Ontario and Nova Scotia all said that they would not license these graduates to practice, or the words they would use, we would not call them to the bar. I know some of you don't know what that means. They think that, hey, Jimmy, you better get over to the bar. It's last call. That, that's one form of being called to the bar, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about here. The law societies have the power to determine who can practice law in a province and who can't. And so these three law societies said, we will not allow your graduates to practice law in our provinces. And their objection was to do with the community covenant of this university. Now, the university requires all enrolled students and all staff to sign this covenant that says this, that they will abstain from sexuality outside of heterosexual marriage. 
So that means no premarital sex, that means no extramarital sex, it means no homosexual sex, that's what it means. And so that's what they've always had as part of their, their covenant. And these law societies said, no, 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 no. If you do that, then that excludes people who are members of the LGBTQ community from attending your university, and we consider that discrimination. So therefore, to protect the integrity of the legal profession, we will not allow you to practice law in our provinces. Now, they were very careful to say this. We're not saying you can't exist as a university. All we're saying is that your graduates may not work in their chosen profession because of their religious affiliation. Did you catch that? Not being allowed to work in a province because of your religion? That's exactly what happened. So Trinity Western went into this campaign to fight it in the courts, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Church of the Rock was part of this. We actually supported this, this campaign. It went to the Supreme Court. Recently, they ruled, here it was, are you ready for this? They ruled seven to two against Trinity Western University. And for all intents and purposes, this, this law school will never happen because of this. And here, here's the crux of the matter. It's a complicated judgment, but essentially they said this. They said, look, if there was a hypothetical student that was a member of the LGBTQ community, they would not be able to sign that covenant. Therefore, they would be prohibited from going to that school. So therefore, you cannot, we're going to support the law societies on this. Now, understand this that the, the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada knew exactly what they were doing. And what they were doing is, in my opinion, they were launching systemic religious persecution against the church. You say, really, you think it goes that far? Sure it is, think about this. See, if, if you went to a private Jewish university, would it be their right to expect you to practice Judaism? What do you think about that? Yeah, it'd be their right. If you went to a private Muslim, private, Muslim university, and they wanted you to bow, bow to Allah five times a day, would that not be their right to have that expectation for you? Yeah, see, this has nothing to do with the LGBTQ community. It has everything to do with a Christian university wanting their students as best they can to adhere to biblical values. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It has nothing to do with any hypothetical human being that might want to go to this school. It has to do with the people who are already there and for them to be living like Christians. And the Supreme Court of Canada says, you can, you can live like a Christian if you want it, but don't think you're going to get a job. That's the world that we're living in now. And if that doesn't make you sad, then it should make you sad. And where is this going to go next? This is a watershed moment. And I can't help but feel that our values are being trampled underfoot. And so you say, well, what's the answer? Well, the answer, Jesus told us what the answer was. He said, if the salt loses its flavor, that's what happens. So that means we have to regain our salt and we have to regain our light. And I don't think the answer is political. I don't think we should write more petitions and write more letters to our MPs. You know what I think? I think you and me need to start living out our faith in real time, in real life, and start being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you on the screen here. These are, these are the characteristics of a salty Christian. And they're the characteristics of salt. Number one, they penetrate. Number two, they preserve. And number three, they promote. So if you know anything about salt, when you uh, put salt on food, it almost instantly penetrates. That's why you like to put your, your salt on your french fries at the last second, right? You put them on, eat them right away, nice and salty. We love the taste of salt. If you leave it an hour, the salt has penetrated the food. It's still there, but it's not as salty to the tongue. And that's an amazing thing, is that salt has this ability to penetrate something, and once it penetrates, you can't take it out. Now, I want to tell you a little story from the Old Testament that it should really help us in this, in this journey. You see, in the book of Daniel, it was in 586 BC, we had Nebuchadnezzar, he came and he attacked and he destroyed uh, Jerusalem. And he took a bunch of these people from Jerusalem as captives to the city of Babylon, this pagan city. Some of them were, were, were still in Jerusalem, but many of them were actually in Babylon. And we know some of the stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they were all there. And so back in Jerusalem, after this happened, there was a, a prophet, or a so-called prophet, by the name of Hananiah. And Hananiah, he stands up, and he wants to be an encourager. And so he says, 
Two years, and this will all end, and the Lord will break the back of Nebuchadnezzar. So everybody was pretty happy. Wow, this is going to happen two years, and the Lord's going to deal with this. And then Jeremiah stood up and said, Amen, so be it, if that be the case. But I won't, because that's not what's going to happen. Because God has prescribed that there will be 70 years of captivity. Which one of them was right, by the way? Jeremiah was right. It was 70 years of captivity. So then this is what Jeremiah did. He wrote a letter to the captives in Babylon. People like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then in the letter he said this. He said, seek the peace of the city where you have been carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. And that word peace is the word shalom, which means welfare. It doesn't just mean peace. It means welfare. And so he says, I know you're taken captive, but I want you to seek the peace of this pagan place where you're living. I want you to seek the welfare of Babylon because in its welfare, you're going to find your own welfare. And then he told them to do this. He said, I want you to build houses. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to marry and have children. And I want your children to have children. And he says, I want you to increase and not be diminished. What did he tell them to do? He told them to penetrate the pagan culture in which they lived. And so what happened was these, these people realized that that's what they needed to do. They needed to become part of the culture. And they needed to be the salt of the earth. And that's exactly what they did. I'll give you a modern day example of this. We have a congregation down in the North End. And we planted this a number of years ago. And we had a group of people, uh, of staff, and they agreed to go to the North End. And they had a passion for this community. And there's lots of challenges in the North End. And you know what they did? These people, they literally moved to the North End. And you know what they're doing there? They're building houses, and they're planting gardens, and they're getting married, and they're having children. They're doing exactly what Jeremiah told them to do. And in the peace of the North End, they're going to find peace, and they're going to bring shalom, and they're going to bring well-being to the North End because they have a passion for that community. So they're going to go, and they're going to infiltrate that community. They're going to penetrate that community. That's how you change the world. That's what the Scripture is telling us. So Daniel gets this letter. So he knows exactly what to do because he's actually in the king's palace. And it says, And Daniel distinguished himself above the other satraps and governors so that the king made him third ruler in the land. you imagine this? And Daniel did not compromise. Did Daniel compromise? Here's the thing I don't want you to miss about Daniel. Daniel was a salty believer. He went and said, I'm going to live my faith out come hell or high water, and more hell than high water, right? And he just went in there, and he was living his life out. So then the other leaders, they were jealous of Daniel because Daniel was getting promoted in the midst of this. So this is what they did. They went to the king. They, they played the king. And they said, you know, king, you know what would be a great law? Here would be a great law if you told people that they could not worship any god except for you. And pray to anyone but you. And of course, being an egomaniac, he went, that's a good law. That's really a good idea. So he signs the law into law. And of course, this is a problem for Daniel, isn't it? Because Daniel prays every day. In fact, Daniel prays three times a day. So Daniel hears about the law. And who remembers what the consequence of breaking the law was? You get thrown into the lion's den, is what happened. So he hears about the law, that the king has signed the law. Daniel makes his way up to his room, opens the windows in broad daylight, and bows down, as was his custom, three times a day. And he prayed to the Lord. So what did he get for his efforts that day? He got arrested, and he got thrown into the lion's den. That's exactly where he ended up. And who remembers what happened in the lion's den? Anybody remember? It says, the Lord shut the lion's mouth. Anybody know what lions and dens do to people? You know what people are? Lunch. That's what, that's what people are. Have you seen these lion trainers that, that do this stuff? Have you seen the, these guys? I mean, look at the lion. Look at the guy. If I'm that lion, I'm going to bite his head right off. I mean, that's what's going through my mind. I, why they're sticking their heads in the lion's mouth beyond me. Uh, but what we have is we have Daniel who went into the lion's den because he would not compromise his beliefs. And don't miss this, that God shut the mouths of the lions. Some of you are going into the lion's den. And God will shut their mouths. So the first thing to do is we need to go and penetrate the world in which we live. The second thing we need to do is we need to preserve. 
Now, the amazing thing about salt is that when it, it makes the f food taste good, but it also preserves the food. And in Jesus' day, there was no refrigeration. If they wanted to preserve food, they put salt on it. It was preserved for an extended period of time. Salt preserves meat. You know what you are? Meat. <laughs> I just told you that, right? Lion's food. And uh, it's funny because if you go to the Dead Sea, people will put themselves in the Dead Sea to be preserved. And they will go in for psoriasis and arthritis and all kinds of stuff. And I've been there and I've seen people go into the Red Sea with psoriasis and come out after a couple of days of going in and out completely healed. Now, you want to be careful not to stay in too long because you'll turn to this. <laughs> everything turns to salt there. And uh, it's no joke. You leave it in that sea, everything crystallizes to salt. And so our job is not only to penetrate, but to preserve. You know, it was C.S. Lewis that wrote this. He said, we don't need more Christians to write more books about Christianity. We need more Christians to write more books about everything. What was he saying? He was saying we need to begin to penetrate every area of society. It's not about us just being Christians in some sort of vacuum somewhere. He says we need to go and we need to influence our world everywhere we go. What he was saying is that we need Christian doctors and lawyers and engineers and teachers. I mean, talk about a mission field as a teacher, the professors. And the reason we're not influencing our world is sometimes we haven't seen our responsibility to be around the table when these decisions are being made. And so we can be there and we can make a difference in our world. That's what C.S. Lewis was talking about. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said that you were the salt of the earth. So a few years ago, I had a friend from a, a call from a pastor friend of mine. Scott Gillingham is his name. Some of you know him. He was the pastor of Grace Church right in the West Perimeter there. And he phoned me up one day. I was a little surprised by the call. And he said, Mark, I feel like the Lord's speaking to me about going into politics and running for office. And he says, I know you've been there and done this, and I want to get your opinion. And I said, Scott, if this is what the Lord's telling you to do, you need to do it. And so he goes to his congregation, he tells his congregation, and they were aghast, and he had people that opposed him and said, why would you compromise your call? Why would you step down and walk away from the call of God? See, they couldn't see the fact that maybe politics was his call, right? They couldn't see this. And, you know, we have this ethic in the evangelical world today that, that if you're a pastor or, an, or a missionary, then you're somehow doing God's work, and everybody else is just, you know, Whatever, you're just kind of whatever going through life. And we forget that Psalm 103 says his throne is in the heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And he is interested in every aspect of life and every aspect of our world. And Jesus said to be salt of the earth and the light of the world. So Scott makes a big decision, decision because he had people that were opposing him and he went and he ran in the last civic election and he won. Not only did he won, but our mayor, Brian Bowman, uh, appointed him to the executive policy committee. So now he's in the inner circle, just like Daniel was. And so then two weeks ago, we hosted the mayor here at Church of the Rock and he came to a prayer meeting that we were hosting. We had 100 pastors out. And at the end of the meeting, I was thanking him for coming and, uh, and I was seeing him to his car. And I said, Mr. Mayor, i got to ask you a question. I said, how's my friend Scott Gillingham doing at, at City Hall? He says, Mark, i got to tell you, that guy has been a breath of fresh air. He said he's intelligent, he's insightful, he's helpful. He is doing an amazing job. Isn't that exciting to hear that from the mayor? <laughs> See, what, we, what you need to understand is wherever, wherever you are in life, God's placed you there. He has set you in that place. It doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. It doesn't matter what your occupation is. God has placed you there for a purpose to be salt and to be light. And you can make a difference in this world no matter what you do if you understand first and foremost that you are salt and you are light. It's like my story about the two brothers, twin brothers, Alexander and Jimmy Jones. And as fate would have it, as twins, they were born on the same day. Who would have thought? Five minutes apart. But as fate would also have it, they died on the same day, just five minutes apart. And the first one into heaven was Alexander. And when he arrived, St. Peter met him at the gates. And he said, uh, your name and your occupation, please. And he said, the name is the Reverend Alexander Jones, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in New York City this past 34 years. And St. Peter said, well, welcome to heaven. Here's your wooden staff. 
your woolen robe, and that's your cabin at the bottom of the road. So he starts down walking away, and just five minutes later, who's there but his brother Jimmy? And Jimmy arrives, and St. Peter says, name and occupation. He says, the name is Jimmy Jones, taxi cab driver in New York City this last 34 years. And so St. Peter says, Jimmy, we've been waiting for you. Here's your golden staff and your silken robe, and that's your mansion at the top of the hill. Well, his brother Alexander's only a few steps away, and he turns, and he says, you know, you know, Peter, I'm not one to complain, but I've been preaching the gospel for 34 years, and he's been driving cab, and he gets gold and silk and mansions, and I get wood and wool and a cabin. He said, what gives? And St. Peter said, well, Alexander, it's like this. Up here, results count for everything. And while you were preaching, everybody was sleeping. And when your brother was driving cab, everybody was praying. <laughs> you all want to go buy a cab now, don't you? <laughs> Last and final thing, and I'll just wind it up with this. So the, the salt, what it does is it penetrates, it preserves, and the last thing it does is it promotes. And what it promotes is flavor. He says that the salt loses its flavor. And you know, I used to think I liked potatoes, and I found out I really like salt and butter. Because <laughs> potatoes don't really taste like anything to me. But if you put salt and butter, you know, Kathy says, you want some potatoes? I said, no, salt and butter is good. You know, I don't really need the, the empty you know, calories. And, uh, and you know, it's a funny thing that that that's what we are to be, is we're to be flavorful to our world. We need to promote. And that comes right back and circles back to being the glowworm. And it's about burning a little brighter. And Jesus said, he told us what it meant to be the light of the world. And he said this, he said, let your good works be known by man, and they will see those good works, and they will glorify your God. And see, when we live and act like salt and light, people notice it. And they want to be like us. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it's true. Let me close with one final story here. So I decided I was going to join this men's tennis club, this men's tennis league. And I decided I was going <laughs> to join a, a seniors one. And I thought, you know what? I'll be able to beat all these old guys, right? Well, it turns out I can't because they've been playing for 45 years, and they're all really good. And that was not what I expected. I should have gone in a children's one. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, I, I joined this seniors, this seniors tennis league. And so I am out there. I don't know any of these guys. And how many of you know that every group of men always has one guy that's the class clown? Anybody know that? In this case, it wasn't me, and, and it was Brian. He was a class clown, but because it's tennis, he was really the court jester, <laughs> is what he was, right? You get it. And so, anyway, Brian has got a smart out comment. He's like the worst tennis player there, but he's got a smart out comment for everybody and everything. So he comes over to me, asks me what I do for a living. I told him I was a pastor. He says, oh, are you like one of those televangelists? I said, no, I'm not like one of those televangelists. I am a televangelist. <laughs> you know, why not, eh? And so he said, oh, really? You're a televangelist. So have you tricked your flock into buying you a private jet yet? I said, you know, I've been trying that for years. It's not working for me. I, I said, I'm not sure what those other guys are doing, but it ain't working for me. And so, I, you know, so anyway, he's just going at me, you know, about, you know, he's got all these negative comments about Christianity. He says, you know, my brother's a Christian like you. He's a, a navigator. You know what a navigator is? I said, yeah, I know. He says he works at the university trying to evangelize immigrant students. What do you think of that? I said, it seems pretty good. He says he sends me letters every month. And he tells me what he's doing. Then he ends the letter like this. He says, if you like what I'm doing, please send us some money. He says, well, I write him back. And I say, I don't like what you're doing, and I'm not sending you any money. <laughs> I mean, he's a real piece of work, this Brian guy. So every time I see him at tennis, he's giving me the gears about being a pastor and a televangelist and fleecing the flock. He's always got some smart out comment. But I just was myself which, of course, is engaging and funny and enlightening and fun, right? You, you know who I am. And, uh, you know, he kind of met his match with me, with me. You do know I have the gift of the gab, right? And so anyway, we're kind of going at each other all the time. So anyway, one day he shows up at tennis, and overnight he's gone completely deaf in one ear. And he's very distressed about it. He's lost his hearing. He went to the doctor, and the doctor says, we don't know what it is. We don't think you're going to get it back. It looks like you're deaf. So, so he's, he's going on about how he's deaf, and this is what he says to me. He says, you know, if you were any kind of televangelist, you could just lay your hand on me and go, be healed, and I would be healed. That's what he says to me. And I said, 
I could do that. And, uh, and he says, well, why don't you? I said, I will. And so anyway, then something happened, and we had to go play our game, and so it never happened. So the next game, the next time we played, the next week, we're out there, and in front of all these other men, he says, hey, Hughes, I thought you said you were going to pray for my ear. And I said, I will. I said, would you like me to pray right here? He says, yeah, I want you to pray right here. I said, in front of all these people? He says, I don't care. If, 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 you, can, if you can pray for me, you can do it publicly just as why as privately, can't you? I said, I could do that. And so then I gathered all these men. Imagine this. I got all this group of crotchety old farts gathering, to <laughs> gathering together, praying for Brian. And we lay hands on Brian, and we're praying for, and I'm thinking, I don't know what just happened here, but something cool is happening. You know what? His ear didn't pop open. I had hoped it would. But here's what I don't want you to miss. All it says is that we have to be the salt and be the light, and people are going to notice, and they're going to want a little piece of what you have, and what you have is Jesus, and you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world, and so let your light shine that men will see your good works, and they will glorify Jesus. That's what glow worms and salty dogs are, and that's what you are. Let's stand together. All right, we're going to do a couple of things before we go here, so don't run off. Number one, every, every head bowed and eye closed just for a moment, because I know in this room there are people that have never invited Jesus into their life to be your Lord and Savior, meaning you've never had that definitive moment where you've said yes to the work of the cross. And as a result, you're not sure about your eternity. You're not sure if you were to die tonight if you go to heaven. And if that's you, it's so easy. He's done everything you need to get into heaven. All you have to do is accept what he did on the cross. So I'm going to make this very simple for you. I'm not going to call you forward or single you out. Every head is bowed. But if you would like to make a decision today, if you're feeling that tug in your heart that you'd be like to be part of this thing that I've talked about today, and I know it's not always easy and there's lots of challenges in it, but I want you to just slip up your hand right where you are. And by slipping up your hand, you're making a decision today that you would like to invite Christ into your life? Who would like to make that decision? Thank you at the very back today. Thank you on the side. Anybody else would want to say yes? I won't call you forward. Thank you, sir, at the very back and in the corner. Thank you. All right. Great. Anybody else want to join these folks? All right. You can all put your hands down. We're going to all pray together because I said I wouldn't single anybody out. Lord Jesus, Jesus. I thank you for the cross that you died for me and you took away my sins. And then you rose again on the third day, and you forever live to be my Lord. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Today I'm a new creation in Christ. Today I'm a Christian, and I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a shout. One more time, every head bowed, every eye closed. This will just take a moment. But I want to ask you a really personal question. How many of you, as you were listening to me, talking about the salt being trampled underfoot, how many of you, as you were listening to me and thinking about your lot and your place in life, how many of you, if you're really honest, think, I need to be a lot saltier than I am? Let me just see your hands. Nobody's looking around. This is between you and me. You need to be saltier than you are. And almost every hand in the room is up, and I've got my hand up with you. And let's pray together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, Jesus. I'm making a commitment this day to listen to your word and to obey your word. And Lord, help me to be the salt of the earth. Help me to be the light of the world. Help me to make a difference where you have planted me, that you have placed me to penetrate, to preserve, and to promote your good name. Holy Spirit, come and do your work in me and help me to become the man or woman of God that you have called me to be. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's give the Lord a shout, shall we?